Reimagining Success, episode 140. You're listening to Reimagining Success, the podcast where we help you reimagine your future, designing a life and career beyond the nine to five that allows you the freedom, flexibility, and fulfillment that you've been dreaming of. I'm your host, Anna Lundberg. Now let's get started on those dreams. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back for this month's Escaping the 9 to 5 series. I'm here with Matthew Jamauer. Matt and I met on LinkedIn, actually, which is always a great place to connect. I've been following Matt's post with interest. He's a copywriter. I'll let him tell you in a moment, but he's his uh, posts always make me smile and really interesting insights about his business, which I'm now hoping to bring to you all. So, Matt, thank you so much for your time today. Why don't you tell us in a few sentences what you were doing before and what you're doing today? Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, before I was a copywriter, I worked in payroll for 12 years Um And eventually, as I came towards the end of that career, I wanted to write a bit more because I was writing books and stories and I'd started a writing group. So I wanted to look for a job in writing, really. So I I tried to be a copywriter over 12 months and then over the next year and a half, I worked part-time and eventually moved into full-time copywriting in 2018. Amazing. Sounds like a very smooth, natural journey. So if we go back to that time, as you said, the the career came to an end. What Mm. was happening then? What was it that triggered, I guess, first that you started the writing alongside that job and then ultimately why why you left? Yeah. um, So maybe four years ago, I was made redundant from my job in payroll, but I was given an 18 month um, leave period because the payroll system has been outsourced to an external company in payroll that pretty much means that everything has to be run at the current company and the new company so it has to go on for like 12 months 18 months so I had a long notice period and I'd got to the point I think in my career in payroll where I just just was hating every second of it to be honest I um, wasn't a career I really wanted to get into I was kind of pushed into it um in a previous job and I just got to the I really want to do something that I, I enjoy doing and I was writing stories I'd taken creative writing classes and I was just loving writing so much I'd written a lot when I was younger you know match day football reports for mm-hmm. for amateur football teams and fan fiction and I'd always written but never really considered it as a career so I think I just got to that point where I was so tired with working in you know, an industry that I just had no interest in, that I, I thought I need to find something and writing was the thing. And I, I just came across copywriting really when I was looking for careers to go into and that's kind of how it happened really. So yeah, it was that 18 month period that gave me the basis for me to train and learn, you know, that obviously you can be a writer, it doesn't mean you're a copywriter. So just to learn what it, it took to be a copywriter and just all the different types of, you know, web copywriting and, you know, blog posts and, you know, to brochures that are going out in print, just all the different types of styles and kind of try to work out what it was I wanted to do. And yeah, that, that's kind of what happened. Mm-hmm. And it, and it's interesting because it sounds like the redundancy and that that great runway there was was a fortuitous circumstance for you, I guess. Some people naively wish for redundancy because you get forced into making the decision you wanted to make anyway. I know it's a theoretical question, but do you think you would have come to that point of of actually quitting or, or were you sort of too comfortable there? Do you do you think you needed the redundancy to shake things up a little bit? Uh, yeah, I think so, actually. Yeah, I haven't really thought of it that way. But yeah, I think I needed the redundancy. It was, I was, you know, I was for a long time getting really tired and just fed up and but it it's one of them things you just kind of keep going and oh well I'll just look for another job possibly would have come up um but yeah I think I needed the redundancy to really make me think wow suddenly you know I was lucky that I had such a long redundancy period Mm. um most people don't get that well yeah pretty much nobody gets that so it was it gave me time to think about what do I want to do? I had time to look at all the different aspects of writing work and kind of decide what was for me. Um, I think 
if I hadn't had the redundancy, yeah, maybe I'd have continued what I was doing. I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing. I knew, know my work ethic was starting to slide. I wasn't, mm. I wasn't putting in the effort. And it's not because I had a bad attitude. It was just, you know, it's just, I think, that tiredness of, like, I don't want to be doing this anymore and I, I don't want to do that extra hour. I don't want to do overtime. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to go out of my way to to go that extra mile that, you know, you're expected of when you work in a, you know, an office that, you know, just pulling your weight, you just start to let, let things drop a bit and you just, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think definitely what you've said there, which is something like I've said, I haven't considered before, but yeah, I think I needed the redundancy. Mm. Well, it's just interesting. It is hard to take that leap for some people. And we have a lot of fears caught up and, and we're just in that comfort zone kind of trundling along. But it sounds like you would have probably got to a point, as you said, you were losing interest in the motivation. I think if we don't have that reason and, and it, it can really wear you down, like I'm here and I don't want to be here. It's a horrible place to be, isn't it? So going to, to work every day and not being interested in it, even if you've got the skills, you're not very passionate and motivated to do your best. So you knew you wanted to do writing and it sounds like you discovered copywriting as a potential potential area you could monetize I guess make money with and then you took some courses and so on I know so what were the challenges I guess again that sounds very yep I worked out what I wanted to do I learned about it and then I launched my business so what did you find most difficult in that process um I think getting my head around that just because I could write a book didn't didn't necessarily mean I would make a great copywriter and I think that process and luckily I had a great tutor who was a professional copywriter as well and made me realize pretty quickly that that yeah just because you've written written a story or you've you can write Mm. books that it's a completely different skill and getting my head around that initial kind all right yeah because I think when I first started trading I was like oh yeah it's writing I you know anyone can do it and you know I've it was writing in that different style and my tutor very quickly put me in my place to say, look, this is, this is a different skill. And I, I think just getting my head around initially the differences was, was quite difficult, but was also, you know, really enjoyable as well. Um, in terms of starting a business, um, yeah, I think the most difficult thing I would say in terms of like starting a business is what everyone at the beginning trying to find the clients, trying mm. to, play, to find clients that will pay, you know, for your services. And especially when you start out, everyone want, you know, it's, you know, can you, can you do, oh, can you do it really cheaply? And mm. yeah, I think that was the biggest struggle when I started. I think I'm sure everyone goes through it. You, you start taking work that maybe you shouldn't be taking or taking it for, for bar- barely anything. You know, a lot of things like most writers, I started out on, like content mills for a few months going on Upwork and Fiverr and doing stuff that really was should have been better paid. I think it was that realisation I needed to actually start charging more and just having the confidence to do that as well. I think, again, was another difficult part of of um, becoming a copywriter and just, just running your own business, just coming to that realisation, oh, actually, I am worth more than this. I'm trained. I've This is my time and my energies I'm putting into this and I'm getting very little, little for it. And I think, I think the biggest challenge was upping my prices Mm. overall, just having the confidence just to go, I'm going to miss out on a lot of work here, but I am going to reach those people that that value what I do. And it has worked. So that's so interesting. I think, as you said, the fact that you're a good writer doesn't make you a good copywriter. And then the fact that you're good at your craft, in this case, copywriting doesn't mean that you know how to run the business, does it? So, and I guess copywriting for your own business is different than copywriting for your clients as well. And as you said, there is that kind of early phase I think we all have to go through. We don't have the confidence yet. We don't yet know which clients we should be saying yes to and probably feel like we should say yes to all of them because, oh, I should be so grateful that I have any work and we're just... I'd like to hear that you're very quickly realised then um, that that wasn't going to work. That doesn't work as a business model. You you knew that you were good at what you did. You had the value and then you're able to increase your prices. So, okay, so you mentioned your mentor, tutor, who helped you out there and sort of helped you find the way. Where else did you get the support to overcome some of those challenges you talked about and, and ultimately set up a successful business? Uh, yeah, I think initially from my wife was the greatest support that I had. Uh, my wife is a teacher 
Um, she'd been a teacher for 25 years. So mm -hmm. she'd gone far enough into her career that she's on a decent wage. So we kind of looked at like, right, okay, what money do we need to have coming in for us to pay the mortgage and pay the bills and everything else that needs to be paid for? And we kind of worked out, yes, we could survive on her wage if as long as I brought in X, Y, Z amount every year, uh, so every month. Um, so just that initial support to be able to go freelance full time and know that, yes, we could, when we weren't going to be in financial difficulties, we could pay the mortgage every month. And just having that safety net was a, a big boost for me. And, and it, it's not something that everybody has when they go freelance. And I'm, I know I'm very lucky in, in that sense to have had that support. And I think just from other writers as well, the support I got at the beginning, you know, as a new writer, and the writing community is a really inclusive one and everybody supports each other. And if, if someone can't take on any work, if they're, you know, overwhelmed with work or it's just something that they don't want to do, they will hand you work just, and it's just an amazing community. And that, that support that I had, I got so many jobs in my first year, you know, when looking back at them, were they the best paid jobs? No, but they were jobs that I needed mm. just to keep, you know, keep learning. And yeah, so I think my wife was the biggest support, but then the writing community is just an amazing one. And I worked with so many brilliant writers at the time who were handing me work. And how did you discover those? And how can just, people build that kind of community with the writers? Did you connect with them online via your course? Um, mostly Twitter, mm. I think, at the time. Um, LinkedIn, although it's a great resource, I think when I started out, wasn't as big on as many copywriters, I think, in mm. the community at the time. I found a lot of them on Twitter. Um, and it, it, I'm okay, I couldn't even remember how I found them. I think it's just... Honestly, just like, you know, ha looking for hashtags for copywriters, and I just came across a lot of them. And I I Googled um, local copywriters, and I spoke to some that were local just for advice. And every single writer that I've ever spoken to has always given me advice on pricing or how to approach, you know, a, a client. Um, so it was mostly just through social media. In my experience, it was Twitter. And then, as I think... It, I think LinkedIn has grown a little bit more. You know, it's a lot more less overly professional and stuffy as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So I think more and more copywriters I found on there over time. And I think especially when I started about maybe four years ago, that LinkedIn wasn't quite as busy with copywriters then, um, which I think it's exploded now. But mm. yeah, I think, I think for me it was Twitter mainly. But I also joined... Um, pro copywriters as well mm -hmm. and kind of got familiar with some faces on there and contacted them so it was just me literally trying to find these people that that i'd seen on the internet or and just try to kind of speak to them and eventually you know it's it's grown into a huge community and now on a slack group that is made up of, of freelancers and copywriters oh, amazing. um and it's just an amazing place to go because people are posting on there, look, I've got this job in, it's not my thing. Maybe you'd like to do it, Matt, or somebody else. And you can just go on there and ask them, you know, all sorts of questions. You know, people are now coming to me and asking me for, mm. for my advice, which blows my mind because I look back a few years, I figured these are, those are the questions I was asking three or four years ago and people are now asking me. So it's great for me to pay forward the advice mm and to pass on work which i do i pass on work all the time i re recently got a thank you uh, card from a couple of writers that i pass work on to um one of them sent me a pair of stripy socks as a thank you nice <laughs> <laughs> um and the other one sent me chocolate so perfect so, chocolate i'd go with the chocolate myself <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's just amazing this just to get that support i think if you are a copywriter i mean i don't i can't obviously say what it's like for other people but for if you're a copywriter listening to this and you're just and you and you're so stuck for work just just contact copywriters get on twitter mm. find them find me um find lots of other writers and just get involved it's i think what has helped as well is is an event on twitter every tuesday now called content club uk mm -hmm. 
Um, that takes place Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Um, and it's just full of freelancers that just, you know, you ask, answer free questions and it's just a great place to network with people online. Um, and that that has kind of been a big help for me as well, just to meet so many people mm. through that. I love that so much. The community, I think, is so important, especially that you can do it online, of course, in the last year has been necessary, but but always mm. we feel we need to meet people, but it's fantastic to hear that you can meet people that way. And I think that community is sort of people who understand, who get it, and as you're going through the difficulties, and I love that you were able to pay it forward. As you said, you start out not knowing anything, asking all these, how do I do this? And then within just a couple of years, you become the the master that um, mm. they look up to, don't don't you? And then the fact that you're even able to pass off jobs and again I think someone starting out might not imagine gosh I can't imagine getting to a place where I have too much work or work that I would say no to but again it's a bit of that abundance mindset as they call it that hey there is enough work for all of us if it's not a fit for me it could be a fit for you and then I trust that you will either help me in the future or you'll help someone else or not what else will help me and and I love that so really great to hear and some really good concrete tips there and thank you for your offer Um, and then coming back to your wife I think that's fantastic of course having a supportive spouse but also as you said doing the maths and sitting down and going okay Okay, well, this is the run where we have. As you said, I need to be earning X, maybe not the full salary right away. That's not realistic, but at least you know, I think it's always good to have that sort of black and white to know the situation with the mortgage and, and everything like that. So paint the dream for us. Now you painted a bleak picture of the payroll world. You didn't want to go to the office. You weren't motivated. So what does your life and your work look like today? Um, oh, I love it. Um, it's not that I disliked having colleagues, but I just didn't like the office atmosphere. I just didn't mm-hmm. like... Yeah, I'm not into gossip and mm. <laughs> did never really watched any of the programmes that my colleagues watched. You don't so watch I never Love really <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, and I just I always like to just working on my own. It's it mm. makes me sound like I'm really really miserable and I wasn't. It's just I think, you know, when we all leave school or college, university, whatever stage we go into work from. I think we're all conditioned to, well, this is your workplace and these are your colleagues and this is the piece of carpet you walk around and you must all get on and you must all want to speak to each other. And I, I, for me, I just, even from when I went into my first job when I was 18, I just just didn't like, well, not, not that I didn't, I just didn't like work, but I just didn't like, I just didn't feel like I, I enjoyed the forced community, mm. which is what we all, you know, it, it's, it, that's the workplace and that's just the way it is, you know, that's just life. But I think there are lots of people out there who are like me that are a bit more of an introvert that, mm. do you know what, I just want to get on with my work and yes, I might want to speak to the odd person in work, but I just want to concentrate on what I'm doing. And, and I think that's what I've always been like. I've always been someone who wanted to just kind of get on with my work and mm. just just be left alone, I suppose. Um, and I think that's what being a freelancer working from home does for me. I can I can just get on with my work. I can just and I enjoy what I do. Yeah, you know, I just love but I also speak to people like yourself, or I mm. can speak to another writer. I have clients that I speak to on video calls or phone calls and email, you know, Twitter. So for me, that is just as much as being mm. my colleagues and speaking to people as speaking to people face to face um not seeing people every day doesn't bother me so much um i know it, it it's an issue for some freelancers that they miss that community and absolutely if, if you need the co-working mm. space or you mm. want to go work back for an agency or anything like that or take on staff and become an agency yourself that's absolutely fine i think just for me and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there thinking, God, he sounds a bit weird. <laughs> but I know there will be people out there who think, I would just love to to work for myself and work on my own. It's not that I dislike people. It's just I never liked the office atmosphere, mm. never liked the gossip and the small talk. And, you know, I had lots of friends in work. It's just, just I think, my own personal preference and yeah. just being able to get up now whenever I want and start work when I want. I can set my own hours if I want to work from 6 a.m. till 3 in the afternoon and finish early, I can, or I can work 10 till 7. Just having that that option, you know, if I, if I literally need to catch up on some work, if I, I could do just doing an hour on a Sunday, 
just to get myself ahead of myself on Monday morning, I can do that. It's just having that freedom that I would never do working for a company. You know, yes, I would do overtime, but I would, wouldn't really enjoy it. Or mm. I might have to go in on a Saturday now and again, but you just be like, oh, I've got to go in and work. <laughs> and it's doing that for yourself. There's just, there's just mm. none of that kind of reluctance to put in that extra effort which I think especially towards the end of my career in peril I was struggling with I just didn't want to do the overtime and mm. yeah but for myself I've just yeah you know I don't work 15 hours a day but if I've got to mm. catch up I'll, I'll go, well do you know what I work from half seven till four most days um but a lot of the time I might work until six and I but I don't think oh I'm working another two hours here mm. and he, I'll be like yeah let's let's get this job finished and that's out of the way for tomorrow. Mm. And, you know, I never thought I'd enjoy overtime <laughs> and working for myself. I do. I'll happily do it. And it doesn't feel a stress to do it. It doesn't feel like, I've, Oh, I don't want to do this. I thought I want so, to print yeah. that out on t-shirts. I never thought I'd enjoy overtime. It's quite a good uh, slogan. <laughs> can you use that in your copy? But I, I, I think that's so interesting. The freedom, flexibility, the autonomy over your time that you can choose. It's not that we now love our work so much that we want to work all hours, mm. but it's a different thing, isn't it, to work for yourself and to know that that means, hey, tomorrow I can maybe take the whole day off for a few hours and so on. And I've got to say, I'm a, I'm a bit like you. I'm sort of introvert, extra, somewhere between the two, but I... I wouldn't say I hated the office, but certainly I love, I'm very self-motivated. I love working for myself. And as you said, I love connecting with people like you. And, and I talk to my clients. I have my group calls. I have my one-to-ones. I'm writing. I feel like I have all these friends and colleagues and I have that social energy without having to commute to the office. Of course, now there's all this talk of the hybrid office and the hybrid working. So it'll be interesting to see that extra flexibility. Maybe I'll be out of a job and nobody will need my support because everybody will love the, the new office environment, let's see. But um, I think that's that's maybe uh, remains to be seen. But um, yeah, that's that's lovely. And the fact that, as you said, you now enjoy it and, and uh, you you want to do the work that you're doing is is a really beautiful thing and it's the way it should be I think really um you've given us some really great concrete tips but any other advice you'd like to share for somebody perhaps who has been stuck in that career for a long time um that they haven't quite dared to leave or even now facing that redundancy how can they reframe it to see it as an opportunity maybe to retrain and, and look for something else um I think I would say that be prepared that it, it won't be an overnight success mm thing i think i've been contacted a few times from other freelancers writers saying oh i want to go freelance i want to be self-sustainable mm. in six months and you know if you're very lucky very very lucky i would say then yes that could happen but for me my main piece of advice is that be prepared for it to take years to grow your business mm. um i'm now into my third year um and it it took around about two years to really mm. start getting repeat clients and start being able to get work that that meant I could make a living. Um, so yeah, my main advice would be to make you know make a plan. Mm. You know, be prepared that you're going to have times, especially in your first year, where you're going to have weeks possibly where you get no work mm. i mean it's obviously going to depend on you know the industry and the type of work but i went through weeks where i had no work so when i had those quiet times i worked on my own business i tweaked my website mm. because at the beginning no you know google's still crawling it you're still trying to work out who you are what you're offering what your tone of voice is you know what your ideal client is if you if you're not sure from the beginning which you know a lot of people aren't Mm. I wasn't, you know, I knew a little bit, but I wasn't sure who I was really targeting. And just use those quiet times to work on your own business, write blog posts, you know, show up on social media. Mm. Social media, such a huge thing that you've got to show up, you know, all the time, post daily if you can, you know, or if you can, at least post, you know, especially on maybe LinkedIn, at least three times a week if you can't do it every day. Just keep showing up, just keep offering good advice to your, target audience because and never be afraid i would say to repeat yourself because mm. someone who someone who read it yesterday you know that's fine and they might read it today that you post something similar or similar advice but there's someone who didn't see it yesterday and there's always someone who hasn't seen what you're saying so don't be afraid to mm. repeat yourself but also just to keep being helpful just just keep showing up just show your personality you know 
whether that whatever your personality is, whether you're mm. quite dry and sarcastic or whether you're very professional, it doesn't really matter. Whatever suits your your business and your audience, then just just keep showing up. Um I think just just yeah. Just be prepared that it will take a while because I think so many people want to be an overnight success and it mm. happens for very few people and I know there will be one or two people out there thinking, well, I managed to be self-sustainable in six months mm. and I think that is amazing. Um, but for most of us, you'll have times where you'll you'll mm. have a load of work and you'll think, oh, wow, I'm a success and then suddenly those clients disappear and mm. you've got to build those relationships, you know, not just with the clients that you're working with, but on social media, because people will think, oh, yeah, I really like their tone of voice. They sound like they know what they're doing, but I'm not sure whether I need them yet. And if you keep showing up and you keep being consistent, those people will remember you. Because I have a client who really likes what I was doing on LinkedIn a few years back, mm. and she got in touch. She's like, oh, I really like tone of voice. I'd love you to write for me, but I've only just started my business, and I'm not sure I can afford you yet. I'm not really getting the clients. and." Even back then, you know, maybe three years ago, I was too expensive for her mm. and I wasn't expensive <laughs> a few years ago, but she remembered me and I kept showing up on mm. LinkedIn and it kept reminding her, yeah, I must contact Matt, I must contact Matt. And eventually, like a year later, she's like, remember me, I contacted you a year ago randomly. Amazing. I really want to start getting your insights for one of my clients needs a copywriter, so because she was an agency. Um and it's kind of worked from there. And I work with her, I've worked with her on and off now on, on various projects over the last three years. Um, and that's just purely come from building, you know, a relationship online and just, just keep showing up. And if people will notice you, and there, there are people that will work with you in five years' time mm. who have seen you now. It's just that, you know, they might not be able to afford you, they don't need a copyright at the time, and then circumstances change, or they've got a writer in house, and then that goes a bit wrong and maybe it works out cheaper for them to outsource it. Just keep keep showing up, keep being helpful mm. and just expect it to take a while and don't get too downhearted mm. in the down times because there, there were times when I was looking at taking in temp jobs mm -hmm. and just, you know, these jobs where you fill in for a day, you get a phone call at 8 a.m., can you come in and fill this okay. office job? For, for half a day or two days while someone's gone off sick. Luckily for me, it never happened. I seem to get working just around those mm -hmm. times. But don't be don't feel like you're a failure mm. if you have to take part-time work, whether that's evening work, even if you're working in a supermarket, if it's stocking shelves or working in the back room or working just in, a, in an office filing for two days a week. Don't feel that if you have to go back to a, a job whether that, you know, it's not something to be ashamed of. You've not failed. You're you're making sure you've got money to put back into your business so you can pay your bills, so you can carry on being freelance, I suppose. So if you have gone full-time and work is slow and you're struggling to pay the bills, take that temp mm -hmm. job. It You know, there's no rush at the end of the day. There's no one keeping a time run on when you have to be successful. So whether it takes you a year or five years, it doesn't matter as long as you get there in the end that that's all that matters do you know what so many nuggets there but i think the key message is that you're in it for the long haul so as you said manage expectations that will take longer if you need to or want to take a part-time job temping or even some projects that aren't exactly the client you wanted in the meantime do what you need to do knowing that you're working towards that goal and in a handful of years you'll be in that position as the guru <laughs> advising other people and you'll have those those clients and i love that example i've had that too of a client who or has got in touch and has me able to afford you or it wasn't working and then they come back years later so it's really nice to obviously hope Hopefully all clients won't take that long to work with us, but um, it's nice to know that people are watching. They might not be liking and commenting, but they're there. And when they're ready, if you keep showing up consistently as you do, then then you'll be in the right place at the right time and they'll they'll remember you. Also, as you said, the personal brand, being yourself, having the the tone of voice that fits you and that people will, will either love or not love, but um, you'll attract the people who love you. I do also want to refer back because you mentioned the co-working space and, I, and that's such an important piece too. If you're 
you're not like you and me and you do want to be surrounded by people, that's really important too. Don't give up on the idea of being a copywriter or working yourself because there are ways to, as you said, join an agency, be in a co-working space, have a team. And so it's always about bringing to life the business in a way that suits your preferences, your personality and so on. So Matt, I'm definitely going to link to your LinkedIn. Where else can we find you? How can we read more about you and uh, hire you if you're available? Yeah, um, my website is indeliblethink.co.uk. Um, I'm also on Instagram at indeliblethink and I'm on Twitter at indeliblethink1. Nice. Number one, number one copywriter. Number one. So thank you so much, Matt, for your time. Really enjoyed hearing your story. I'm really happy for you and your success and look forward to hearing and following you, of course, on LinkedIn as well over the next few years to see what's next. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. If you'd like to create your own transition story and escape the nine to five to work for yourself, then come and join us over in the Business Incubator. This is a comprehensive online program and community designed to give you the roadmap that you need to help you figure out what you really want to do, come up with a workable plan and take the right steps to achieve it. Read more and join us over on onestepoutside.com forward slash nine to five. That's onestepoutside.com forward slash nine to five.